Greetings and welcome to the channel. Are you tired of having to put on snow tires every year and then having to deal with storing them for the rest of the year? Or maybe you just moved to an area where it snows and you're confused by all the terminology associated with winter tires. If so, this video is for you. We're going to break down all that winter tire terminology for you and give you the results of a long-term road test on a set of tires that may make it unnecessary for you to ever put on snow tires again. Weather ratings and markings on tires can be confusing, so let's start with a discussion of those. The first are the letters M plus S, which stand for mud and snow, and they will be printed on the sidewall, sometimes in relatively small letters, so you might have to look hard to find them. This M plus S rating first appeared in the 1970s, after the first all-season tires were invented, and its meaning has evolved since then, on, and on today's tires, it can be genuinely deceptive. In fact, if the tires on your car have only an M plus S rating, they are not necessarily intended for moderate to severe snow at all and would in fact be only useful under light snow conditions. What you really want to see if you live in snowy conditions is this symbol, the Three Peak Mountain Snowflake or 3PMSF. If your tire has that symbol on it, it is a genuine moderate to severe snow tire and has been tested under those conditions. And this is where it probably gets confusing if you're in the market for winter tires. A true winter tire will have both the M plus S and the three peak mountain snowflake symbols. A so-called all season tire, however, might well only have the M plus S symbols indicating that it really isn't useful in anything other than the lightest snow. So, an all-season tire with only an M plus S rating is only all-season if your winter season is very mild. Now I don't think there was any intentional deception here, I just think these designations evolved as the designs of tires evolved. Snow chains have been around as long as we've had automobiles, but an actual snow tire wasn't invented until the 1930s in Finland and it wasn't until the 1950s that a commercially produced snow tire was available in North America. Even after Goodyear introduced the first production snow tire called the Suburbanite in 1952, most people either weren't aware of them or couldn't afford an extra set, so they just used the good old-fashioned tried-and-true method of putting on snow chains every winter if they needed to get through heavy snow. I was a kid growing up in that era, and my dad was not about to spend money for an extra set of snow tires when he had free child labor available to help him dig his car out. Once we'd cleared the snow out from in front of the car, we'd lay out some chains, roll them on, and install them, and off he'd go. Now that I think back on it, I'm pretty sure that school districts invented snow days so the kids could stay home and shovel snow. But time marches on, and since chains were a hassle for everybody, and sometimes tore up the road work once the streets had been plowed, it wasn't hard for companies like Goodyear to convince everybody that snow tires were an absolute must. Of course, Goodyear didn't have the corner on the market for snow tires for long, and by the late 60s, all the major tire manufacturers were producing them. But they weren't about to sit around and lose their competitive edge in this market. So in 1977, Goodyear unveiled the most innovative winter tire they'd ever produced. Innovative because it wasn't just a winter tire, it was the first all-season tire. If you believe the advertising hype of the time, you'd think you could put a set of these tires on your car and leave them on all year long even if you lived in a typical snowy environment. I mean, it says so right there in the ad. There's a snowflake and that tire's sitting there in a big pile of snow. Of course, all the other tire manufacturers immediately jumped on the bandwagon and started making their own all-season tires, and then a lot of confusion and questions arose over just what the definition of an all-season tire is. And that's when the U.S. Department of Transportation jumped in and came up with the M plus S rating to be marked on tire sidewalls. If your tire had that rating, 
you could know that it had been tested to certain standards of traction in mud and snow conditions. Now that M plus S designation that was created in the 70s still exists today and you'll still find it on the sidewalls of all season tires. But even as early as the 1980s, people began to realize that tires that just barely met that standard, the M plus S standard, were not adequate for moderate snow conditions. And in many communities, you just couldn't get by without a set of snow tires anyway. So the all season tire became kind of a joke in climates where you had real snow. Finally, in 1999, the Three Peak Mountain Snowflake symbol was adopted to indicate a tire that had actually been tested in moderate to severe snow conditions. You'd be justified at this point in wondering why I began this video suggesting there was a tire you could leave on your car all year long, even if you lived someplace with moderate to severe snow conditions, when all I've done till now is try to convince you there is no such thing as an all-season tire. The explanation is that I don't recommend all-season tires. What I'm going to suggest is an all-weather tire. And if you think I'm just playing with words here, don't blame me. I didn't create these terms. The all-weather tire is the latest, latest technology in tires intended to be left on your car all year long. So let's take a quick look at the visual differences between winter tires, which appeared in the 1950s, all season tires, which have been around since the late 1970s, and finally all weather tires, which have made their appearance within the last five years. In spite of their differences, these tires do share some common terminology, and knowing these terms will help you better understand how these tires actually work. All tires have blocks or lands, and that is where the rubber actually meets the road. This is where traction occurs because that's your contact patch. That's the place where the rubber is actually going to make contact with the asphalt, or in some cases, snow or ice. The next obvious feature are the grooves, and you have grooves that run around the circumference that are the main grooves, and side-to-side -side grooves, the lateral grooves, that move from one side of the tire to the other. Now the main grooves are meant to collect liquids, snow, mud, water, and the lateral grooves are meant to eject that material. So as a tire is working, as it's rolling along a surface that is covered with liquid or snow, the purpose of these grooves is to collect it and eject it. It's an interesting fact about tires that if you're driving on a smooth asphalt surface with no rain or mud or snow, you actually would get best traction with no grooves at all. In other words, one big solid surface of rubber. A tire like that is called a slick, and that's what race cars use because the most rubber in contact with the road, the best traction you have. In other words, the grooves are a necessary evil. They give you better traction in soft surfaces like snow or mud, and then they get rid of the rain when you're driving in wet conditions. But on a dry surface like asphalt, they actually reduce your traction. And even though it's not really a consideration that most people have when they're buying tires, the bigger the blocks are and the bigger the grooves are, the more noise a tire will make on a dry surface. The last important feature in this illustration are those little zigzag lines on the top of each of the blocks. Those are fairly deep cuts called siping or sipes, and they increase traction. There's a fair amount of evidence that siping itself is the greatest contributing factor to traction in snow and ice. Now there will always be grooves because we do have to deal with uh, water running out even in winter conditions but the siping is what's giving you the ability for the tire to bite into snow and to get some grip for trying to stop on slick surfaces like ice. I don't have any evidence to prove it, but I think that siping must be a fairly expensive process because I've noticed that the more expensive winter tires do have more extensive siping. Now that we have all that background information and terminology squared away, let's see how it applies to the three categories of tires we might want to purchase for our car. First is the pure winter or snow tire that carries the Three Peak Mountain Snowflake symbol along with the letters M plus S indicating suitability with mud and snow. Traditionally, this type of tire will have an aggressive tread pattern with pronounced blocks and grooves. 
and they will be made of a softer rubber compound that stays flexible in colder temperatures. And by colder temperatures, I mean 40 degrees Fahrenheit or less. And of course, these tires will have a lot of siping in a variety of patterns to give us that necessary grip on snow and ice that these tires are designed for. The main negative feature of these tires is that you have a greatly reduced tread life in warm weather. You simply can't keep these tires on your car all year long and you really need to change to summer type tires as soon as the weather gets above freezing and stays there. This last feature isn't really much of a problem because in most cases you'll be changing your tires to summer tires when the weather warms up. But if you do leave these tires on, they are often very noisy on dry streets and highways. Now let's move on to the second category, the so-called all-season tires. And if you've been paying attention, you'll understand why I make air quotes every time I use that phrase. And you will also recall that the uh, M plus S symbol is on these tires indicated they've been rated by the Department of Transportation for mud and snow conditions. But in fact, the so-called snow conditions they've been rated for were at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or above, meaning it is no longer snowing. There may be some snow on the ground, but it's certainly not going to be a real winter condition where snow is falling. The tread pattern of these tires is designed primarily for rain and warmer conditions. And you can see that the grooves themselves are pronounced. You do have plenty of room to gather and eject the rain. And these tires are perfectly suited for rainy conditions. These tires are made to last. And because of that, they're made of a harder rubber compound. The problem is that hard rubber loses traction in temperatures below freezing. The benefit of having the milder tread pattern and the harder rubber compound is that you get a quiet and more comfortable ride with a much longer tread life. And finally, these tires do not have nearly as much tread siping as the winter tires for the simple reason they just don't need it. The siping is especially good in those slippery conditions and these tires just aren't meant to drive in those conditions. And now we come to the last of our winter tire choices, the hero of our seven decade saga of winter tire development called the all-weather tire. But is it truly an all-weather tire? Well, to start with, it has the same ratings as a pure snow tire, meaning the three peak mountain snowflake symbol and the M plus S mud and snow ratings from the Department of Transportation. But this tire looks different than a pure snow tire. It has a more complex tread pattern that is asymmetrical, meaning one side of the tire is a little bit different than the other. This tread pattern is the result of some very sophisticated engineering and testing, and it's supposed to make this tire equally at home in snow, rain, or mud. Not only that, but the rubber compounds that this tire is made from will stay flexible at cold temperatures just like a snow tire will and yet they won't degrade as fast as a snow tire when the weather warms up. Of course these tires will also have plenty of tread siping in order to get those winter tire ratings and that siping might be responsible for some of the customer complaints about noise on dry surfaces. Most of those complaints however say that the noise is very minor and in fact not a very significant issue. Nevertheless I will address it in the long-term road test of all-weather tires that I include in the last segment of this video. In closing this discussion of winter tire selection I'd like to remind you that there is no perfect tire for everybody. You need to have your own personalized knowledge base before you make your decision. First and foremost is to know your climate. If this is what your typical snow conditions look like on a daily basis during the winter, you need to be shopping for one of these, not snow tires. I personally have no experience living in places where your neighbors have reindeer and sleighs, so I can't comment on what it would take to have to deal with this kind of snow on a daily basis. Where I live in Colorado, it's unusual for us to get more than a foot or two of snow at the very most, so our tire selection considerations are clearly far different from those 
in the more northern states or for anyone living in Canada or Alaska. The next area of consideration is your local snow removal policies. This can be so important, I think you should consider it even when you're deciding where you want to buy a house. The main street running through my own community is the dividing line between an incorporated city and an unincorporated area that is operated by the county. Literally, on one side of that street, the snow plows are out immediately in the middle of the night as soon as snow begins to fall. But on our side of that street, the snow plows don't come out until noon the next day. As silly as it may seem, it means that in a typical winter here, people on the other side of that street could have a very cheap set of all-season tires on their car and get around just fine, but we have to have a good set of winter tires just to get out of our own driveways. The next factor we have to consider is your vehicle itself. If you drive something like a sports hatchback with low profile large diameter tires like this one, the effectiveness of winter tires can be reduced and in fact the ultimate solution might be to just park this car for the winter if you have a second car alternative. I'm not saying it's impossible to drive a sports hatchback in winter snow conditions. And in fact, one of the two vehicles that I did an extended road test on using all-weather tires was a Veloster like this one. But that experience did prove to me that these are certainly not ideal cars for winter snow conditions, and I'll explain more when we get to that segment. If I was going to suggest the ideal car for commuting in urban and suburban snow conditions, it would be a light SUV like this one with four-wheel drive. And notice that I said four-wheel drive and not all-wheel drive, because there is a difference. Although all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive have similar characteristics in cruising dry road conditions, at low speeds in snow, four-wheel drive has a definite edge. I think the best illustrative example of that is when you encounter these snow berms from snow removal. It's not uncommon for cars to get high-centered and stuck when they try to cross over these things, and because of that, in some cities, it's actually illegal to try to cross them. When they've got a good-sized berm like this in front of my wife's business, only her car, a four-wheel drive Jeep, and her boss's car, a four-wheel drive pickup truck, can cross over this berm to get in and open the business. And once they've done that, they can then come back out with snow shovels, knock down the berm so that all the people that are driving all-wheel drive cars can get in. I guess the point I'm trying to make with that anecdote is that if you don't have four-wheel drive, you better have a good set of winter tires. Next on our list is to know your state and local laws regarding tire requirements in snow conditions. These are sometimes called traction laws, and they vary from state to state, so I'm just going to use my home state of Colorado as an example and give you some of the requirements that I took off their own website. These are the five requirements for my state, and I actually I should call them options because you only have to meet one of them. Surprisingly, the first one says that as long as you have a four-wheel drive or an all-wheel drive vehicle with 3 16 inch tread depth on your tires, you don't even have to have all season tires. Kind of makes me wonder if AAA lobbied for that requirement because I'm sure it keeps their tow truck drivers busy all winter. Moving on to number two, this would be the traditional all season tire, tires with mud and snow designations, the M plus S icon, as long as you have 3 16 of an inch of tread. Number three are the true winter tires with the mountain snowflake symbol. Now number four must have been written before they had a good knowledge of what all-weather tires really are because as we know all-weather tires will have that same mountain snowflake symbol giving them the same authorization as number three. And of course number five the last resort when you're in deep snow and you just can't get the car to move any other way. While I was on the state website, I went ahead and looked around for some of the advisory information that is non-regulatory. And in that area, I found this information about what tires are safe. They mentioned that winter tires are the safest for snowy and icy conditions, and then go on to say that all weather tires are essentially just as safe. I guess what's most interesting to me is item three, where they mention that 
uh, M plus S tires are simply better in snowy conditions than non M plus S tires. And that, my friends, is a perfect example of damning with faint praise. I also found this little graphic on the state website, which isn't representative of any particular brand of tire, but it does give you a pretty good example of how stopping distances are affected by the different categories of tire. This is important because stopping distance is really the most important safety factor when you're selecting winter tires. The M plus S and Three Peak Mountain Snowflake ratings are in fact entirely associated with acceleration and stopping distance, not about cornering. In other words, if you're out in snowy conditions driving like Lewis Hamilton, then God is your co-pilot and there's not a whole lot your tires are going to be able to do to help you. But if you're just trying to get to work and you need to drive over one of those snow berms, or if you're on the freeway and you need to stop suddenly because of that guy driving like Lewis Hamilton in front of you spinning out, well then these ratings are applicable. But safety isn't really much of a factor when you're just tiptoeing over a snow berm trying to get out of your driveway. But when you're at freeway speeds trying to avoid an accident, stopping distance can be the difference between life and death. And that's why this chart is meaningful to me. It also provides a good segue into the last of our knowledge considerations, knowing your own driving abilities and limitations. Now over the years I've had conversations about assessing your own abilities and limitations with literally thousands of people in all of the shop classes that I used to teach. And in all those conversations, I found out that there are two things you don't imply someone isn't any good at, and one of them is driving. So I'm not going to here. I'm not suggesting that you're not a good driver. But winter driving in snow is its own unique skill set that can't be learned any other way than putting in the hours behind the wheel. I personally have more than 50 years of driving experience and everything from race cars to farm tractors to 80-ton airplanes. But none of that, and I mean absolutely none of that, is anything like driving in snow. My wife works in an auto collision repair shop and every winter business is good. And I can be fairly certain that every one of those cars that comes in with its front end punched in was driven by somebody who had a surprised look on their face when they found out they did not have enough room to come to a stop. And so, in my opinion, it's at least prudent to consider your own personal mastery of the laws of physics when you're selecting winter tires. And now, finally, we get to the portion of the video that many of you clicked in for in the first place. This is where I review the Celsius all-weather tire, and I don't think you're going to find any other reviews on the internet quite like it. I too searched for reviews when I was looking to buy these tires in the first place, and I didn't find any on the web that did what I'm about to do, and that's to summarize actual experience with more than 20,000 miles of driving on two different cars with two complete sets of these tires. So let's start by looking at this advertisement, because there is a key point on here that I think is very important, and it made a difference in my selection, and that is that warranty. I was seriously concerned about the reliability of these tires. I didn't have any doubt that they did perform well in winter, but I was not sure that they were going to last as long as all season tires. But when the company offers a 60,000 mile warranty to back up their own confidence in the product, that was good enough for me. And let me reiterate something that I said in an earlier part of this video, and that is there is no such thing as the perfect tire for all climates, all vehicle types, all driving styles, and all driving abilities. Just as sure as I post this video, there's going to be somebody out there saying, winter tires? I don't need no stinking winter tires. Why, I've been driving on ice and racing slicks since I was 10. And of course, there's no way I can debate anecdotal statements about people's driving abilities. So if that happens to be you, well, then I say more power to you. I just hope I don't run into you, literally, on the I-25 when it's snowing during rush hour. As for my own pedigree, if you're interested in such things, I am not a professional tire reviewer. I don't have a degree in tire engineering, and I don't spend all my time out on a skid pad with a bunch of meters attached to my car measuring tire performance. 
I'm just a guy who's managed to commute to work and back safely for 50 years without a single accident and who knows what works and what doesn't on my car to help keep that record clean. And hey, guess what? I'm going to start this review by telling you the results. Did this single set of all-weather tires perform just as well as a set of regular snow tires in the winter and another set of all-season tires in summer and rain conditions? And the answer is... Yes, they performed flawlessly in snow and rain conditions and felt comfortably grippy in warm weather on our winding mountain roads. But wait a minute, before you get all excited again, haven't I been saying all along that there's no such thing as the perfect tire? There is always a catch. So no, these tires are not perfect, but I don't consider their problems to be a deal breaker. If you drive these tires hard in hot weather, they might wear faster than all season tires. And I say might because frankly, you can wear out any set of tires quickly if you drive them hard enough in hot weather. That goes back to that consideration of driver technique and driver ability that we talked about before. Also, if you have a car that has heavy understeer like my Jeep, I definitely recommend that you rotate them more often than Toyo suggests. As for the road noise issue, I wasn't even going to mention it until I was making this video, and I remembered reading another review two years ago before I bought my tires where they complained about the noise. Frankly, we've never noticed it, but just to be fair about assessing this as a potential issue, last week when the roads were dry, my wife and I drove around and listened really hard to see if indeed maybe these tires make more noise than the all-season tires that we have on our minivan. And well, yeah, kind of, sort of, maybe. I mean, with the windows down and listening really hard, we could hear a little bit of road whine from these tires, but it's not something that we ever noticed with the windows up. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because other reviewers who are tire experts have claimed that they have heard noise. And who am I to argue with the experts, right? So anyway, moving on, here's some hard data about the weather conditions during the two-year test period. Now these are just averages. The summer temperatures were averaging 90, but we did have several periods uh, where we'd have a week or two weeks at a time where it got up into the hundreds. And we did have several periods during the winters when the temperatures dropped well below zero. And in fact, early in the mornings, when it's still dark and I'm warming up the car for my wife, it's not unusual to see 15 below. Currently, the Jeep has about 14,000 miles on that set of tires, and that's two full years of driving with two hot summers and two fairly cold winters. There's currently about a quarter of inch of tread left on these tires, and that isn't exactly great, but I'm sure I burned a lot of that tread off in the first summer that I owned them when I really abused them testing them on some mountain roads. This car has been used for a weekday commute every day in those two years of about 15 to 20 miles, uh, partly freeway, partly surface streets. And at the very early time of day when my wife makes that commute, the streets in our neighborhood will remain unplowed. The second car used in our test was a red Hyundai Veloster seen here shivering under a light snow in November. This car is definitely inappropriate for snowy weather and it is not unusual for cars that uh, ride this low to get high centered on snow berms. So what the usual solution is, is to put these cars on a set of smaller diameter wheels with higher profile narrower tires that will give more ground clearance. But my son didn't want to go to the expense of buying an extra set of wheels and tires and then trying to find a place to store them all year. So when we put the Celsius tires on the Jeep, he bought a set for the Hyundai. His commute distance was approximately 30 miles from our home south of Denver to his job at Denver International Airport. 15 of those miles are on surface streets to avoid toll roads and the other 15 miles were on freeways. The Celsius tires he installed on this car had the same large diameter low profile specifications as factory stock. And he did make it successfully through two winters with those tires on this car, but in the process, he did have to avoid snow berms and was sometimes forced to detour around them. And now some driving impressions based upon my own personal preferences and driving style. I consider myself a fairly conservative driver, but I did spend quite a few years when I was young driving high-performance cars and motorcycles, 
And I believe that experience makes me at least a reasonably capable judge of car handling and tire performance. We decided the first challenge for these tires would be some mountain driving on a very hot summer day when the temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And what better place to do that than the hill climb race course at Pikes Peak. With the old tires, the car would have a fair amount of body lean and a significant amount of understeer, meaning that the front tires tend to plow if you bomb into a turn with excessive speed. But guess what happened after we installed these new Toyo Celsius tires? Absolutely nothing, that's what happened. The car still had a lot of body roll and understeered like a pig, but not nearly as much as a 1970 LeBaron. And of course, that's what I expected. No tires are going to make an SUV into a race car. But what did change for the positive was the stickiness of these tires in steady state cornering. And that's no surprise, because it's common for a brand new set of tires to give you that glue to the road feeling. What isn't common is for tires to feel anywhere near as grippy after a year of driving. Yet these Toyos still felt comfortably sticky into their second summer on those mountain roads. So grippy, in fact, that I undoubtedly overdrove them, contributing to premature tire wear. I can't leave the subject of summer driving without mentioning rain, because we sure get some here. The natural topography and the uh, weather patterns in this area produce enormous thunderstorms on an almost daily basis during the summer, and quite often these will dump an inch or two of very hard rain on us before they move on across the Great Plains to Kansas and Nebraska. They generally reroute air traffic or ground airplanes during a deluge like that, but traffic on the I-25 continues unabated. These tires performed well under such circumstances, and I can happily report that I never even had to activate the anti-lock brake system, even while braking hard to avoid other cars hydroplaning and spinning in the guardrails on the freeway. I have to admit I was a little more concerned about how my son's car would do because his performance tires, being so wide, might be more inclined to hydroplane. But nothing like that happened, and I can happily report that the summary experience of the three of us driving these two cars on those two sets of Celsius tires was totally satisfactory and hard rink. Sure, we had a few nervous moments braking hard to avoid other cars out of control on lesser tires, but our tires performed flawlessly in the rain. And now we come to the subject which you're probably most interested in, which is our driving impressions of these tires in snow. As you can see from this view of our driveway, we do get snow, and this recent storm gave me an opportunity to go out and shoot some footage driving under actual snow conditions. Yeah, mea culpa. When I bought these tires, I had no idea I'd be doing a review for YouTube two years later. And in fact, it wasn't until this recent snowstorm that I got the idea of doing one at all. We got a call at 4 a.m. that morning from our son who told us that his new Tucson, with its Firestone Firehawk all-season tires, was stuck in the driveway of his new apartment. AAA wouldn't be able to help him out for three hours, and he needed to get to his airline job, so we drove to McDonald's, grabbed some coffee and some Meg McMuffins, and went to help him out. There's nothing particularly exciting about this footage. It's just me knocking over a few snow berms, and here and there I deliberately drive into the unplowed areas just to demonstrate that these tires do their job. I did engage four-wheel drive in a couple of places where I noticed that people were stuck on the hills, but uh, for the most part I had absolutely no need for it. And for the purposes of the video, everywhere I could, I aimed for the thickest snow and the deepest berms. That snow plow that just went by didn't leave a very big one, but it did give us some whoop de doos as we were trying to get out through the intersection. The usual tactic in unplowed areas is just to drive down the ruts from previous cars, but for this trip, just to demonstrate these tires, I'm going to avoid those ruts and go on into the unplowed snow as much as possible. This snowfall was particularly wet and sticky, and it was on top of about two inches of ice from a melt-off from the previous snow, and it was that underlying ice that was giving my son so much trouble trying not to climb the hill next to his apartment. What happened after I turned this next corner was the serendipitous event that led me to make that rather lengthy discussion at the beginning of this video about the difference between all-season and all-weather tires. 
I noticed this car wasn't moving after I drove past it, so I pulled over and walked back to see if they were okay, and they said they were stuck, but they'd called AAA, so they didn't need any help. At that point, I looked down to see what kind of tires they had, and that provoked a question from the driver as to what was I looking at, so I pointed out that they were on a set of all-season tires, and that they might consider a set of all-weather tires as an alternative. And that, of course, led to the question, well, what's the difference? So I embarked on a friendly discussion of sight density and tread patterns, but it soon became apparent that the driver wasn't really in the mood for a lecture on tire technology and nomenclature, so I wished them good luck and went on my way. But it did occur to me as I was driving away that I've had this discussion with enough other people that it might be worthwhile including it at the beginning of this video. Because really, tread and sight patterns site density and rubber compounds are all that's going to make the difference between going up a hill forward and going down it backwards. And finally, to summarize my driving impressions of these tires in snow, they have excellent traction climbing uphill, uh, the same when braking going downhill, and in fact they've never required us to use four-wheel drive even though we occasionally engage it if we're going to tiptoe over a berm. Through two snowy winters with these tires, we've never missed a minute of work or been late to a single appointment. And even in a snowstorm, we don't even cancel our weekly dinner date because we know these tires will get us there and we'll have no trouble getting a table. And if you think I've forgotten about my son's Veloster, I haven't. All of those glowing recommendations about traction in snow and ice are also applicable to his car. But I still don't recommend a car like that for driving in winter because it's just too easy to get it high centered. Still, he made it through two winters with that car with those Celsius tires on it and was never once late to work until he bought a Tucson with plenty of ground clearance but with all season tires. And on that note, I conclude my review of the Toyo Celsius and with any luck this will be the last tire review I ever do because I don't review anything I don't actually use and I have no intention of ever changing to another brand or style of tire. When these tires are worn sufficiently, I intend to take them back to Walmart where I bought them and trade them in on a new set. I don't have any illusions that they're going to make the 60,000 mile warranty because they won't. I'm just too hard of a driver on these tires in the summertime. But I'm perfectly happy to pay the prorated warranty amount in exchange for the peace of mind that these tires give us in their all-weather performance. And of course I'm very happy I no longer have to own two sets of tires and then change from summer tires to winter tires every year and then deal with storing the extra set all year long. And that about does it for this video, but once again let me restate the obvious that no tire is going to make winter go away and weather will always have the final word. No matter what kind of tires you've got or what kind of car you're driving, please drive safely in winter and give yourself some extra time to get where you're going. Being a few minutes late to work is a whole lot better than not getting there at all.